Hi, and welcome to another episode of Get Your Fill, Financial Independence and Long Life, where we explore cool, interesting ways to achieve those two goals, and we invite people on to help us who have already done it. And that's why it is amazingly awesome and fun that Brad Warren is here with us today. Brad is doing land banking. He is a land banking consultant. And this is, I love this description. He helps patient investors to build generational wealth by investing in land. Brad, why do the investors have to be patient? <laughs> great, great question, Christine. So when they purchase land, which we say is strategically placed in the path of growth, they buy and hold, we tell people seven to 10 years is the average hold time. Sometimes you'll exit sooner, sometimes you'll exit later, but you have to have very patient money, like from an IRA or a dormant 401k, some kind of retirement fund or just money that you're never going to need to use uh, because it could take that long for the development to catch up to your area. And that's when you sell to the developer. That's the exit strategy. So you're buying things that you expect at some point, someone's going to be really interested in, but because you're buying them now at this great entry point, you know, it's not going to happen right away. And even once that, once the developer's interested, right, that's quite a long process, even the permitting process and stuff, right? We're not too worried about the permitting process. Once they buy the land from you, that's their headache. And that's why this is a relatively headache-free way of investing. We call it set it and forget it real estate investing. <laughs> but in some cases, like for instance, if you're buying land that is located next to an existing solar farm, one of these big thousand acre, you know, 100 megawatt, 50 megawatt projects, that land might get sold to the developer in a year or two because they built this big project and now they want to infill it and, and build another project. Uh, if you're buying mixed use, like my first property that I bought was a mixed use property, which is the highest designation of the five designations, the five zonings for land is mixed use. I bought that 10 years ago. And one of my friends said, Brad, aren't you worried? It's You're at the top end of that seven to 10 years. And I said, you know what? First of all, I know that there's land very close to mine that's selling for four times what I paid. So I'm not worried. Second of all, the city council in the town where I bought it, the city where I bought it, about six months ago, rezoned the mixed use designation from four stories to five stories. They just gave me an acre and a quarter of vertical land, not horizontal. I didn't get another acre and a quarter on the ground. But now the developer who, let's say, wants to build a hotel, which is most likely what's going to happen, uh, or some kind of, you know, like a, a mixed use building with retail on the first floor and then like office and maybe three floors of condos. Yeah. They can now build a five story building instead of four story. Well, that just That's made huge. my land go up dramatically in value. So even if it takes me 10 more years and I go 20, which I don't think it will be, but even if it takes me 20, this land will sell for 10 times what I paid. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention it's in my Roth IRA. I don't give financial advice, but if your listeners are <laughs> even just a little bit aware of what a Roth IRA does, that's a tax-free uh, tax retirement fund, which means all of my gain from 115000 to, let's say, a million dollars, all of that gain is mine and my awesome. wife's, of course. The two of them. <laughs> I, I got to awesome. include her because we own it together. Yeah, awesome. And that's, you know, you're right. There are all kinds of these great strategies. People don't always realize that the money that's just sitting there, you know, invested in whatever, you know, some ETF or even a, you know, mutual fund or something like that, that you can take that and use it, you know, potentially much more productively inside of some kind of a vehicle like this. So Brad, you were talking about, you know, zoning changes and things like that. So that makes me think, you know, you need to know something about the area in which you're investing so you can have a feel for what's going to be, what the development potential is and things like that. Yes. And uh, when people come to our company to invest, the first thing that we require of them is that they get educated. And the way they get educated is they watch a one hour, we call it land banking 101. <laughs> it's it basically answers about 95% of the questions that people have. Who is your company? How long have you been around? What's the minimum? What's my exit strategy? Where is the land? How do you find the land? How do you know it's good land? How do you know it's in the path of development? Why that? How come you're not all over the United States? Why do you only invest in a 60 mile radius around downtown LA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 95% of those questions are answered in that one hour. 
And yeah. once people have seen it, then they contact me. I, I usually don't even talk to people until after they've watched that. Because if they watch it and they're not interested, then what's the point? We would have wasted their time as well as mine. So right. they watch it and then they email me and they go, OMG, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, whatever G word you want to use. <laughs> Holy cow, Brad, this sounds incredible. I love the fact that your company does all that research, takes away, we call it risk mitigation. Obviously, you can't remove all of the risk, but we remove as much of it as possible. And then they say, tell me more. I still have a couple more questions. I answer those questions. And then if they're still interested, then we actually allow them to invest with us. We're not out actively searching for people. My business is all by a referral. So people have to find me. We, we set the bar a little bit high because we want a certain kind of very patient investor who understands the longer term. Uh, like you said, uh, ETFs and, and mutual funds and stock market. I'm not saying don't invest there. You should have a diversified portfolio. Yeah. But if you don't have something a little bit more long term, that's going to give you what we call generational or legacy wealth, meaning three to seven X return, three to seven times is what you should expect to get with the land the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. Then that's a reason for diversifying your portfolio. So Brad, um, Crap. Sometimes I have these really great thoughts and then they go away. Um, <laughs> yeah. Join the crowd. <laughs> oh, right. So I what I was going to say is, yeah, well, it's like, oh, what's my name again? Um, <laughs> so when someone goes in, they are not, it's not like I can go sell my Microsoft shares, right? They're in this and they have to wait until it's sold. Correct. Unless, I mean, what, what's their exit strategy for yeah. that? Pretty much what you said. Now, now it's their land. If they want to put for sale sign up on it and invite people, but they're not going to get the three to seven times return. Nobody's going to come and offer them three times what they just paid for it. They'll offer them a thousand or 2000 or maybe, maybe you won't get anybody. Plus you paid for the sign. Now you're yes. waiting. <laughs> the idea is when, once you've seen the land banking 101 presentation, you'll understand that this land is in the path of growth. Uh, as an example, I'll give you an example. We invest, like I said, 60 mile radius around downtown LA, mostly in the periphery, all around the edges of that circle. Mm -hmm. One of those areas is called the Antelope Valley in California. It's North LA County, South LA County. The bottom half of LA County is Los Angeles, the one that we all know of, Grumman's Chinese Theater and Hollywood and all that. And, and you know, that's that's Los Angeles. What people don't understand is the top half of L.A. County is the two cities of Lancaster and Palmdale. Current population there now is around 410, 420,000 between the two. Both mayors have said by 2030, which is eight, not even, it is a little, little less than nine years, eight years from now, yeah. the population in the Antelope Valley will be over one million. And this wow. is not me. Speaking. This is not me. This right. is the mayors of both cities in public newspapers and on TV. They're saying this. And that's one of 10 what we call growth factors. There's actually 10 growth factors. We're not going to get into all of them today. Maybe not even the second or third one. <laughs> one of them is population growth. If you don't have people moving there, you don't have demand for housing. You don't have demand for jobs. It's, you know, for Walmarts, for for distribution centers, for uh, Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And this area, when you see the, the presentation, you'll understand, oh my gosh, there's tons of people moving to this area. There's manufacturing. That's the second trend. There's job creation. That's another trend. Uh, all of these things, it's like, it's like a tsunami, like a perfect storm of 10 macroeconomic trends all occurring at the same time in a relatively small area that's driving the land prices up dramatically. State law. I don't know if your listeners are from all over the US or mostly here in California, but California passed a law called SB 100 uh, in 2018. Requires the state of California to get all of its electricity for buildings and homes from renewable sources by the year 2045. Wow. All of its electricity from renewables. Right now, we're at around 35%. Well, it's not going to come from wind. It's not going to come from geothermal. It's not going to come from the ocean. It's going to come from solar. Yeah. 
So they, they, meaning the energy companies in California, particularly PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Power, as well as the 20 other energy companies that have sprung up in the last few years, are building solar farms like nobody's business. Square miles of land are disappearing to these solar farms. They're gigantic. Their minimum, they're about a thousand acres apiece. Wow. Warren, Bu- Warren Buffett built one in Lancaster. It's a $2 billion solar farm. And it feeds renewable energy into the grid. In fact, the energy running my, com- my lights, my computer right now could be coming from 400 miles away from the sun. Wow. So you buy land. You keep your fingers crossed, and in one, two, three years, an energy company, knock, knock, knock. Hello, Mr. Warren, we'd like to buy your land to build a solar farm. Okay, how much are you going to give me? And if it's not in that three to seven X return range, I turn them down, and I wait until they come back and say, okay, you bought it for $30,000, we will give you $120,000. Uh, can you do $130,000? All right, fine, $130,000. <laughs> okay, so. Great. So that's another question I have. So is this something that you could finance like you would if you bought a, a regular a home or something like that? Could people take out a loan on it? Pretty much it's cash, right? Great question. And you, no, well, they could take out a loan. We probably will turn them down and say, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you're waiting 10 years and you're paying interest on the loan. You're going to lose all your profit. Yeah. We want people to buy cash is king. So that's first or queen depending on your your orientation. (laughs) Cash is the best. Uh, And then, so that's about 20% of my clients use cash. About 80% are using a retirement fund of some kind. Uh, A SEP IRA, a Roth IRA, uh, a dormant 401k. My wife and I own 11 properties ourselves. We bought most of them through her dormant 401k from a job she had, you know, 20 years ago. And it just sat there. It was all in mutual funds. And they were doing really well over the last 20 years. We got out before the crash, which was a great <laughs> idea. Uh, yes. And now, all, and then converted it to a Roth, paid the tax now. But yeah. all of those properties that we bought are in a Roth, a, what's called a self-directed Roth IRA yeah. with a company called Equity Trust Company. Yeah. Uh, we love working with them. They understand land uh, very, very much. and. Uh, all of those sales, nine of our 11 properties are in the Roth. All of those sales will be tax-free. So awesome. that's what we want. You can borrow from a life insurance policy. You could get a second mortgage on your house, but we don't recommend those strategies. Cash and retirement funds are the two best ways. Okay. So is is it going to be, because I thought originally when we started talking that it was going to be like a group of people who own each parcel, but sounds like it's it's one-to-one, one person's owning one parcel. Great question, Christine. It's actually both. Okay. There are there are a number of options. You can buy it yourself, which is best because then you have total control on the exit strategy and when to sell. Or you can invest with four non-family members, and, uh, up to four, and up to eight family members. Okay. So let's say you have twenty five thousand, but you don't want solar. Let's say you hate solar, you know, or, or you're, you know, you're anti-solar. I don't. But let's <laughs> let's say you have twenty five thousand. That could get you an acre of solar. But you say, no, Brad, I really like industrial property. Well, that's going to be one twenty five, one fifty at a minimum. Okay, if I get three friends that have twenty five each, can we put the hundred together? Yes, you can. Or you could tell us you have twenty five. You only want to buy a property for a hundred or for around a hundred. Let's say. We will also try to find three other or one other investor with 75 or one with 50 and one with 25. We will go to our network Mm -hmm. and try to find other people to partner you with. But then the downside is you don't know them and you've got to develop trust very quickly because you it takes all four of you to agree on the sales price and the date that you sell. And so if you have different ideas, you could get into trouble. Now, in the 42 year history of the company, we've never had any trouble. (laughs) <laughs> nobody's ever said, no, I want to hold out for more. They all understand land banking. They go to our free webinars on Tuesday night to stay informed. And they understand when it's reached that sweet spot of three to seven X, yeah. then it's time to, to sell and take your money and skip all the way to the bank with a big smile on your face. So Brad, we kind of skipped over this. It's a question I usually ask people right away, but like, how did you get interested in this? how did you get involved in land banking? Oh, oh great question. So um, 
in, let's see, I, I do a quarterly net worth statement. Very important, I think, for everybody to do that so you know where you are and if you're progressing towards your goals. Right. And December 31st, 2011, and I looked at the numbers and I realized I could not retire. I was 60. I was about to turn 61 the following month. And I realized I could not retire. My wife could retire with her money from EA Post and Oracle because she did the 401k, contributed, got the match. I was an entrepreneur, business coach for 40 years. My income was up, down, up, down, up, down all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I looked at the numbers. I couldn't retire. So I called my land banker, Marcella, who I'd known for two years and been listening to her talk about land banking. She came to our house in January of 2012. And I had just turned 61. She did the uh, her presentation at the kitchen table. And my wife got up at the end and said, bye, I'm going back to work for Oracle at my <laughs> desk. Uh, thank you for coming over, Marcella, but I'm not interested. And she walked out. I said, Marcella, this is the only way I'm going to take what paltry amount I do have saved <laughs> to turn into generational wealth. So get me a property. Two months later, March 2012, I bought my first mixed-use property that I alluded to earlier. Yeah. In fact, I only bought 17% of that property because that's all I had at the time. Yeah. A year later, I bought a second property. A year later, I bought a third property. A year later, my wife comes with me to hear Marcella at a hotel doing a presentation. Same one she did at the kitchen table, but it's three years <laughs> later. And my wife bought the whole way in the car, Christine. She said, now I'm not going to buy any property. I don't want to plan. I just want to hear what Marcella has to say because you've now got three. You seem to be very interested. You've been getting these referral fees from sending all your friends to Marcella and they're all buying. I know them. They're very smart. Maybe I missed something, but I'm not going to buy. Well, needless to say, we go, she listens to the presentation and she buys two properties <laughs> in the hotel, pulls out her checkbook, writes out two checks. And I'm like, what <laughs> She said, I got it. I I get it now. It clicked. I going on. It clicked. Yeah. The light bulb went on. Someone was home. They put on the switch. <laughs> Energy from the sun, by the way. That, right. the <laughs> That's amazing. She got it. And that was number four and number five. And then we bought six more since then. And now it's about a third of our portfolio. And my wife said, no more. I said, but there's still more great deals. She said, we got 11 properties. It's a third of our portfolio. I, I like the balance, but I don't want to risk any more in that category. Yeah. And I said, okay. I said, how about compromise? When we sell one, A, we put a bunch into savings. B, we take a really nice vacation. And C, we buy a replacement property. And she said, okay, that, that I'll agree to. So that's our ongoing strategy to build legacy wealth for our daughter, who knows that we own land. She just doesn't know how much and how wealthy she's going to be when we pass on crossover or whatever they call it these right. days if she did you might be in trouble <laughs> we'd be in big trouble we'd be in very big trouble because she'd be spending like crazy knowing that eventually she was going to have a huge amount of money so we don't tell we don't tell her the numbers she just knows that it's going to be substantial nice yeah and that that great, the life right? insurance too <laughs> gosh yeah she'd be yeah. starting to put a little you know arsenic in your food maybe <laughs> <Watch Yeah. out. laughs> Yeah, we, we test the food when she goes up. No, no. Just <laughs> you first, honey. <laughs> yeah, right. Here, dear. Why don't you say it? See if it's too hot before daddy, before daddy and mommy take a bite. <laughs> so, okay, so Brad, what, like, let's say that I'm, you know, a person who's a little bit conservative. I like what you're saying, but you know, what's like sort of the minimum that somebody could get into this for assuming that they wanted to do, you know, their own property hundred percent themselves? Great question. Uh, 25,000 is the minimum up to 2 million. That is the range that we can deal with beyond 2 million. It's, they may have to talk directly to the CEO. Cause I don't even know if we can find properties that are, that are more than that. Yeah. And actually at that point, it's probably beyond land banking because you're not going to get 6 million for yeah. a $2 million property. It's yeah. You could happen. probably buy a town for that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so 25,000 is the minimum, uh, and uh, though I'll tell you, the other day, the last week, we had a solar property for 16000 which I was surprised. It went in 10 minutes. Right. So in other words, when I say we had a property, sometimes the, the headquarters sends Marcella a property. They send it to her Thursday afternoon. She has until Monday morning at 9 o'clock to get the paperwork in and, and sell it. Yeah. And she emails to her network. I email, email to my network. 
Well, within about 10 minutes of her sending that out, it was gone. Yeah. And one of my guys called me that night and I said, I'm sorry, it's gone. He said, what do you mean it's gone? I just got the email. I just let <laughs> I said, I tell you, when these emails go out, 16,000 right. is ridiculous. It's like, yeah. that's nuts. That's crazy. I'm you can't even kidding. buy a car for that anymore. <laughs> yeah. And and this person now owns an acre of solar. Well, we call it so we call it green real estate or green energy real estate, because the only designation, it, it can't build houses on it because of the zoning. The only place it can go is to an energy company for a solar farm. But that was, uh, that, that. see, that's what, another one I would have bought. I would have bought that without even emailing it to my list. I would have cherry picked that one. But my wife said, no, we're not getting it anymore. I said, it's $16,000. It's the cheapest one in our portfolio for crying. It's like <laughs> chop change. And she said, no. So it's true. It's true. Got it Gosh. Right. Now, what are the, um, I guess we, we've sort of touched on this a little bit, but what would you see? Like if someone said, okay, I've got 25 grand, I'm going to either buy, you know, some stocks or I'm going to buy this or, you know, whatever, or, or even I, I could put this as a down payment on an actual uh, piece of real estate. You know, maybe I could buy this store or whatever, you know, like something like that. I mean, where do you see the big advantages of land specifically? Well, first of all, I don't know anywhere in the United States where you can use twenty five thousand even as a down payment. That that, that even at ten percent and get private mortgage insurance, you're talking a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, and even those are almost non existent. I guess unless you're rural Louisiana or in the <laughs> middle of Arizona desert with nothing around, you, you just can't get real estate for twenty five thousand dollars. You can get land. Uh, again, it's it's just a completely different mindset. Uh, it's funny that we're doing this podcast now. I was just on a podcast about two hours ago and we were talking about a mindset shift. Buying land requires a mindset shift in the person who is investing because they probably never heard of it. Yeah. They don't fully understand it, which is why we asked them to watch the sem the webinar first, yeah. the, the uh, one hour presentation, Land Banking 101, because you got to understand it. You got to understand that it is a longer term buy and hold set it and forget it, do nothing strategy. And most people aren't wired that way. Yeah. They want to, you know, collect a rent and have cash flow. Oh yeah, but I got to go fix the toilet. I mean, I, I own one, I got rid of one of my rentals and, and paid off the, the, I sold the second, paid off the first one. So I don't owe a mortgage. That's yeah. great. But uh, my, my property manager just contacted me literally five days ago, four or five days ago. Oh, Brad, we did the yearly inspection. And here's the list of things that's going wrong. There's mold on the ceiling and in both bathrooms. The paint is peeling. The, some of this is chipped. The door, the, and, yeah. and, you know, and I just got the estimate. The cheapest estimate I got was about $525 to get it all, all repaired, yeah. which comes out of my pocket. Right. So fortunately, you know, now my cash flow is still positive. It'll just be less positive yeah. for that month when I get the repairs done. But I'm tired of, we call it tenants, ter tenants toilets, and termites. <laughs> tired. Uh, one year, it was, a, it, my, my, this house is in Pasco, Washington, in eastern Washington. <laughs> I get a phone call. Brad, there's a live snake under <laughs> your house. The tenant is freaking out. I've got to call animal control. It'll be 75 bucks to have them come catch the snake and get rid of it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, yes. What am I going to say? No. <laughs> no. Let the tenant get Live bit with the snake. And get sued for $5 million. And, you know, and the house isn't in an LLC, so it's not protected that way. You know, maybe I should, it's in my trust, but, yeah. you know, anyway, there are pros and cons to every investment opportunity. Okay, I'm pretty much that's a blanket statement. That's my opinion, but I'm pretty sure that it's a true statement, a yeah. true opinion. Every investment has risk to some degree. You just have to decide how much risk you're willing to take, what your time frame is, what your end goal is. I bought my first property at 61. Now that's generally, you know, a 10 year time horizon, 71, still haven't sold it. Another 10 years, I'm 81. I expect to still be around at 81. But for someone in their 40s or 50s, this is got a lot more room yeah. uh, to, to maybe even twice turn it over. You know, do a 1031 exchange if you're not in an IRA. Do right. a 1031 exchange, defer those taxes on the first sale. And then when you hit the big time, so your 25 becomes 125, then your 125 becomes a half a million. Now you got enough to pay the taxes. Yeah, exactly. So it, it really just depends on your 
tolerance level, your risk averse quotient, whatever they call it. Uh, you just have to decide if this is right for you. And, it, and it's not for everybody. I've even turned away a couple of people. I just said, you're, you're not, the questions you're asking me are very impatient kinds of questions. There's no way you're going to wait seven to 10 years without <laughs> bothering me every year. I, I, <laughs> or every I, week. <laughs> quick story, quick story. So this one client calls me after one year. How's my land doing? I said, Rick, let me ask you a question. Do you get on the free Tuesday night updates from the COO to learn what's going on? No. I said, then you don't know how your land's doing because you would know if you listened, you would hear all this stuff. And I said, second of all, Rick, you know, it rained last night. Very rare. They only get about three inches of rain in the Antelope Valley per year. I said, it rained last night. Your land is wet. <laughs> and tomorrow it will be dry. That's how your land is doing. Don't call me for another six years. And he <laughs> laughed. And I laughed. And we hung up the phone. A year later, I get a picture from him. He emails me a picture. And it's a selfie. And, and, it's, and, and the picture is him. And in the background is a solar farm. And I said, Rick, what's that? He says, that's across the street from my land. Ooh. It just was completed. It's an entire solar farm. It's literally, a, I'm standing on my land and that's across the street. I get it about waiting <laughs> and being patient. I'm not going to bother you with phone calls anymore. Have a great day, Brad. I said, Rick, you have a great day. You just made my day. Yeah. And, you know, we'll talk when it's exit time. Yeah. So that's, you know, you, you got to be patient. That the bit, People say, what's the biggest risk in land? You, the investor. <laughs> you, are, you are the biggest risk. If you don't have the patience. I've had two clients that actually had to exit early. And we had to buy them out because they can't put it on the market because the other three people said, no, if you put it on the market and the price goes up, you're going to raise my taxes. Yeah. And we're not going to allow you to do that. So they had to sell it for exactly what they bought it for because one of them had an IRS problem and the other one had a kid in college and the college was more expensive than they thought. Yeah. And, and it killed me that they were losing all the equity that they had gained over the two or three years that they owned it. Yeah. But they said, Brent, I got to get out. You got to help me. And, and my wife wound up buying their portions. We don't like doing that. That's yeah. like very rare, very rare. Yeah. And we don't like doing that. We don't want people to have to do it. So you better make sure that this is money you won't need for a hip replacement, an around the world cruise, uh, a Lamborghini, a midlife crisis, you know, <laughs> Botox, I don't care, you know, whatever it is, use some other money, not this money. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and sometimes we'll turn people away. Yeah, it's. I think it's important that people have a buffer, right? That they're not gonna have to dip into this just for some kind of life thing, right? Exactly. But I just had a weird thought and a question. Um, you know, okay, so it's it's not, let's say that I didn't buy solar land. Let's say I bought some other designation. Like you were talking about industrial. It's still land though, right? There is not a structure there. No structure. But if, if I bought something like, I mean, could I like camp on it or something? You know what I mean? Can you use it in any way? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it is partly up to the city. So if you bought residential land and you put a camper on it, that may be totally legal. I, I, again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the answer to that question, but that, I'm guessing that it's zoned for residential and RV is residential. You could do that. Now there's no, there's no sewer hookups or anything right, like right. that, but you might be able to do that. Now, if it's, if it's industrial land, uh, no, I don't think you can put an RV in that because it's zoned for buildings that are, you know, manufacturing and things like that. Right, right. So again, I'm not giving legal advice, uh, but I would guess that it depends on the zoning. It depends on the tolerance of the city. They don't want a bunch of RVs all spread out. Right. <laughs> so tell people yeah. you're buying dirt and you're going to sell dirt. This is your entry. This is your exit. Yeah. If that's not going to work for you, don't invest with us please because you're you're either going to be upset or you're going to just make me upset and <laughs> I, I don't want that i you know i'm getting too old for upset i like i like easy yeah i like nice and easy investing so brad are there are there sort of similar like questions and concerns that you hear a lot from people even after they've watched the video and well the video answers about 95 percent of the questions that people have uh, who is our company? How long have we been around? How many people can I invest with? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Minimum exit strategy, all that. 
The remaining 5% that I get are usually very specific to that person. Like I have this kind of retirement account. Right, right, yeah. Has this kind of money in it. Or I have these stocks, bonds, mutual funds. What do I do with them? You know, and I, well, I don't get financial advice. Right, you yeah. have to sell them. Well, I don't want to just sell them. Can I put them in a Roth? I said, talk to your Maybe. CPA. <laughs> talk to your CPA. Talk to your financial planner if you have one. If you don't, I'll give you the names of a couple that I use. Uh, and, you know, but call me back when the money is ready to invest. Well, what if I put in an IRA? It has to be that ad I can answer because that is a question. People say, well, I have an IRA. Uh, I have a regular SEP, uh, Simplified Employee Pension uh, Plan or Simplified Employee Plan, whatever it's called, yeah. SEP, S-E-P. Yeah. Uh, I have a regular IRA. And I ask them which company, and they say ABC company. I said, well, it has to be a self-directed IRA, right? And right. we only work with three companies. I'll email you their names. You do your due diligence and pick the one you like. I personally use, and I tell them the one that I use. So you, yeah. where where our eleven are, yeah. um, we we actually do so much business with that company. They have a dedicated staff person who is just for our land investors. So when you call, you ask for May. You say, hi, May, I'm with Valor Enterprises. I have a land banking question. Can you help me? Yes. And you get directly to her. You don't go to the 800 number or anything like that. But you pick the, the one that you want. You transfer your funds in there. You pay your custodian fees and all that. That's all your business. But once the funds are there, then you would call me and say, okay, Brett, I have $95,000 in my, in my self-directed Roth IRA at blah, blah, blah company. Uh, and I want a $75,000 property. Okay, yeah. I'll call you back when we find one for you. Because we may not already own, by the way, when I say we, I'm talking about the company. Right. We right. buy the land first. Okay. So the company uses company money to buy the land. So we buy it very cheap down here. I can't go into how we find it cheap. There's many different ways, but that's for another webinar. <laughs> okay. So we buy it cheap. The company marks it up just below market value. So there's a little built-in equity, maybe five or 10,000 built-in equity. The gap is the cash flow to run the company. Because people say, well, if these lands are going to sell for three to seven times, why don't you just hold it for seven years? <laughs> Who's going to pay our employees for seven years while we're buying this land and just holding it? We have to buy the land, mark it up and sell it to investors to create cash flow to run the company and give the owner a profit. The investor is the one with the patients who rides it way up to the three to seven times and the seven to 10 year time frame. Now it can happen sooner and it can happen later, as I said right. earlier. Right. So that's kind of how it works. And by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, out of every 30 properties that our research and acquisition department looks at, they're looking right now, even as we're talking, they're working nine to five. There's like five or six or seven of them full time. They're called research and acquisition. For every 30 properties that they look at, Valora buys one. We reject 29 out of every 30 because they either, uh, the pricing is not right. They're in, uh, there's an easement running through the land. There, there's a culvert where water could collect. And so you can't build there. There could be a red-legged toad or a tortoise, a tortoise. Yeah, right. Some kind of endangered around. <laughs> uh, it's, it's called an, S, an SEA, a sensitive environmental area. And there are areas down inside the, the, that circle, that 60 mile radius around LA. There are spots in there where you can't build. Yeah. But because commercial real estate is buyer beware, somebody could sell you that property and not have to disclose to you that it's in a sensitive environmental area. And if you didn't do your own research and find that out, you're stuck. Yeah. You're stuck with a worthless piece of dirt unless you want to go down and watch the toads and the wizards <laughs> crawl around, you know, right. but you're not going to get your money back. That's for sure. Right. So right. we do a lot of that risk mitigation up front by doing this incredible due diligence on the property before we even buy it. Because we may wind up holding it for one or two years and have the carrying costs and the taxes on, on that. Uh, and the company doesn't want to have a piece of property that it doesn't know eventually will make it a profit, either selling to an investor or exiting. They may get a call from, from an entry. We had one client who uh, put a deposit down, but hadn't finished the deal. And, a, and an offer came in way above what they were buying it for. And Valor said, 
sorry, that property is being sold to our investor. You can talk to them after the deal closes. So very high integrity. Because yeah. some companies would say, oh, gee, I'm sorry, here's your deposit back. We'll sell it for four times to, to the energy company. And no, we honored the contract and sold it to the investor. And then they got into contract with the energy company. Yep, timing is everything, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So Brad, yep. this is great. I feel like you've covered a lot of things and I think most people would now have a fairly good idea of like, you know, at least some starting information to, to see if it's intriguing them or not. But what, is there a question that you wish I would have asked you? Is there something that we, you know, didn't touch on that you were kind of burning up to say or something you think people need no, to know? No, I, I, you did a great job. Uh, Thanks. Pretty much, you know, minimum return, old time. Oh, taxes, taxes. Okay. I, I just brought that up a second ago and I was waiting for you to ask me the tax question and then I completely forgot it. And so you just <laughs> said, so people want to know what's my, what's my holding costs. If I'm holding this land for 10 years. Am I paying right, 5,000 right. a year? No. Proposition 13, which many of you know was passed in 1978 and was retroactive to 1976 caps the transfer of land. So when somebody buys it from us, it's reassessed at the higher value that is capped at 1.3% of the purchase price if the city even wants to go there. So even on a $100,000 lot, the most that you could be charged for the first year is $1,300, yeah. okay, 1.3%. But because it's undeveloped raw land, it'll be $400, $500. Okay, let's say it's $500. So your first year, your property tax is $500 on your $100,000 purchase. The other part of Prop 13 that me as a homeowner, I love this. My property taxes can only go up a maximum of 2% per year. What's 2% of 500? I believe it's $10. 10 bucks, yeah. So, so your that's, second That's year, not just for residential, that's for commercial and-, and Commercial too, well. okay, I, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I know there are some exemptions to that, but at least on, on residential and on land. Uh, so your next year's tax is 510. And the next year it'll be 520 and 50 cents or whatever. <laughs> so your holding costs. So even if it's 500 a year times 10 years, it's $5,000 plus your hundred. Let's even say it was 10,000. <laughs> so now you're at 110 but you're going to get 330 to 500 back. Yeah, that 10 seems, becomes seems like kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Insignificant. It is literally a drop in the bucket and it's never that much on a hundred thousand. It is probably way less than that. The only other cost that I can think of off the top of my head is the escrow fee. And that's, that's a, a, a tiered escrow fee. We have our own internal escrow department to keep that fee very low. Yeah. We cover the title insurance. We include that in the purchase price. Uh, and we include the natural hazard disclosure report in the purchase price. So there's no additional fees. Um, and then I guess one other question, people say, well, what happens when the client reaches that point and they want to sell? Are you guys involved? Yes, we're involved with the free negotiation coaching. We help the client exit, but we don't get anything else from that. They get the full value from whoever it is that's buying, whatever that contract says, that's what they're getting. Because they're the hundred percent owner, you're out. You're hundred yeah. percent a fee simple deed in California. They own it outright. It's theirs. They can will it to their kids or grandkids or whatever they want to do. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, there's, there, in, I'm just thinking of the escrow fee, uh, title insurance, the natural hazard disclosure report, uh, and uh, they could do a 1031 exchange. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that, but it's a tax so. deferral strategy. So if they wanted it, let's say they had a hundred thousand dollar property, they sold it for four hundred thousand. They could they could work with us and buy a four hundred thousand dollar property. I would get the commission on the four hundred thousand dollar property, just as if I had sold that to them directly. So right. that's the only other way I would get involved. But my commission comes out of the four hundred. It's not tacked on. Right. It's not an additional fee. And if they just want to take the four hundred and go to the bank and pay Uncle Sam, or if it's a Roth, not pay Uncle Sam, right? They're, they're welcome to do that as well. Yeah, we actually did it. I think it was in 2000 or 2021. And there's a great episode about 1031 exchanges. So you can, I mean, maybe I'll try to find a link to that and put it in the show notes for folks if they want to get a little more info about 1031 exchanges because they're a wonderful thing. Excellent, excellent <laughs> strategy for deferring, not not avoiding. Right. 
just deferring the tax, but you can defer, defer, defer every time you sell and eventually never pay Uncle Sam. Uh, some people, you know, wind up with an apartment building. They start with a they start with a single family, then they get a duplex, then they get a small apartment building, then they get a big apartment, and that big apartment building is cash flowing like crazy, and they never sell it. Well, yep, guess what? Exactly. They never paid Uncle Sam on the game. Right. You just exactly. deferred, deferred, deferred forever. Yep, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> As is the Roth. Yes. <laughs> the Roth, yes, the Roth IRA true. is a yeah. more beautiful thing, in my opinion. <laughs> Me too. Fantastic. Yep. So, Brad, thanks so much for being with us and sharing all this with us. Um, any parting words? Oh, how can people get in touch with you? That was going to be my last That's parting it. word. <laughs> the best way to get people, yeah, how do I get a hold of this? That's guy? the most oh, important God. question <laughs> there of the day. <laughs> so, it's my name, my email is my name. It's Brad at Brad Warren dot com brad at bradwarren.com send me an email i usually respond within 24 hours or less uh i'll send those people that email me if, if they're interested i send them the link to watch land banking 101 because i'm not going to even chat with them until they get educated and then if they're interested they would email back and say okay i watch it omg i really want to find out more i do have some more questions then i get on a zoom we chat we meet each other we talk i've most of those calls are usually an hour. Uh, one went for an hour and a half once because they just kept asking more and more questions and I kept giving them more and more information. And we just, and well, what if this happens? And, okay, well, let's look at that. And, but, you know, in the end they bought, which was great. Yeah. Um, but that that's kind of how the process gets started is just email me, brad at bradwarren.com. Easy peasy. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brad, so much. And thank Pleasure. you, listener, for listening. Who do you know who would be intrigued by this? Who do you know whose assets are just sitting there doing absolutely nothing when they could be growing into a really cool solar farm someday? And, or, you know, who knows what? Who knows what? So give Brad a call, watch the video, just see what happens. And share this episode with a friend who you think would really appreciate it. Or even if you don't think they'd appreciate it, just share it anyway. <laughs> and have a fantastic week. <laughs>